The Edinburgh Festival of Fringe is the largest arts festival in the world. For three weeks in August, Scotland's capital buzzes with over 50,000 performances of more than 3,000 different events in venues of all shapes and sizes, with shows from well-known performers and companies to first-timers looking for their big break. As a theatre critic, Edinburgh is a key fixture in my calendar. Every year I come here and see about 100 shows in a month, and that means working non-stop for the whole time. But well, there's just nothing else like it. It's where I see some of the most exciting emerging artists, and it's where I encounter some of the theatre that's really at the cutting edge of the art form from all over the world. Because no one's in charge of programming the Edinburgh Fringe, it changes shape every year. This year, for example, there's a whole new wave of circus shows, and for obvious reasons, a lot of work around border control and migration. It's also busier than I've ever known it. There's a lot of really good work, but so far, at the beginning of week three, there's not been that show that's really stood out. For that, everyone's pinning their hopes on the British Council Showcase. With good reason, too. The Edinburgh Showcase feels like the jewel in the crown of the Edinburgh programme and draws together a wide range of work by a diverse bunch of artists and remounts them at the fringe for a select group of international programmers. The aim being to create opportunities for UK artists to tour and get their work seen by audiences all over the world. What's really interesting is that many of this year's shows turn art forms inside out or straddle several different genres. Claire Cunningham is a Scottish choreographer, dancer and classically trained singer who describes herself as a multidisciplinary artist. Her performances are built around the crutches she uses every day. Starting from the images of beggars in the paintings of Hieronymus Bosch, her showcase piece Give Me a Reason to Live uses movement to explore faith and the religious iconography around disability. For me, I think any work that is generated from the body, from the, uh, using the body as a starting point, to me feels like it's, it's dance. I like people who are really pushing what, what that term could mean and kind of break the traditions of it. When you're uh, choreographing work, your crutches feature quite heavily. How does that change the idea of choreography? I've, I've used the crutches since I was 14. Um, and I came into dance at about age 27, I think. So quite late in my life um, and through very unconventional routes. I kind of found my own way into dance through working on projects, I didn't go and train in a dance school, so the crutches tend to be at the root of everything, so they're not, um, they're not separate from the, the idea of choreographing for me, they're usually at the hub of it, at really at the, at the centre of triggering what's possible actually. Increasingly you'll find shows that take new forms or blur the boundary between performer and audience. Jess Tom, for example, is a theatre maker with Tourette's Syndrome, and her tics ensure that every performance of her show Backstage in Biscuitland is absolutely unique. Kiln's production The Furies reinvents Greek mythology in the form of a rock concert, and Brian LaBelle's You Have to Forgive Me invites individual audience members into bed with the artist to watch an episode of Sex and the City. Brian's not the only artist exploring intimacy at this year's Fringe. Verity Standard's Hug collapses the physical distance between audience and performer almost entirely. It's a choral composition for a choir of about 30 people, but unlike a standard concert, you don't just sit there and listen. Hug is an immersive choral sound bath um, where audiences choose a chair that has a blindfold on it, blindfold themselves, and then throughout the performance, singers enter the room and create a sort of 360 sound lots of voices sort of whirling around. What did you want to bring out with the piece? What were you trying to do with it? Voice is incredibly exciting uh, for me in many ways. I'm really interested in intimacy and voice uh, and how, what that, what that stirs up in people. I'm interested in not telling people how to receive it and for them to very much come and inform it themselves. Um, so for them to come in, experience a piece of music from the inside out, see what that does for them really. Chris Thorpe's show is a look at confirmation bias and the way we tend to surround ourselves with like-minded individuals. Particularly pertinent in the age of Twitter, the production charts Chris's attempts to engage in dialogue with someone at the opposite end of the political spectrum. 
Eventually, this committed liberal comes face to face with a white supremacist and Holocaust denier. A white to argue that they, the white, have been the victim of a racial attack. And you play both sides of the argument, and you play your own views. Uh, and someone who's who's at the complete opposite end of the political spectrum. What what's that feel like as a performance? I actually love the fact that in this that a lot of times people come out and say, until you got a certain amount into a particular section, we actually didn't know who was speaking. Yeah. And occasionally that persists for someone all the way through the show, and they come out confused as to what my actual political beliefs are afterwards. There's a tradition in Britain of uh, quite a strong stand of political theatre, but a lot of it is in the, the form of state of the nation dramas. You're coming at this from a, a very different form and def very different sort of set of aims with theatre. Why so? I think they're different ends of a, the same process. You know, your state of the nation drama is a, a snapshot, and a lot of them are really effective snapshots of the... Um, result of the workings of individual human minds in concert, usually within very established political frameworks. So a state of the nation play has to come out of the interaction between individual states of perception or consciousness much further down the line. All I'm doing is starting a bit, you know, it's a, it's a state of the head play, which will inevitably lead to a nation if you put enough heads together. London is lost Birmingham, it's lost Manchester, it's lost to multiculturalism. We need to... At its core, confirmation forces us to address our relationship with other people's experiences, an idea that's further reflected within the showcase by a number of shows looking at mental health issues. Living Pictures have gone back to Nikolai Gogol, looking at his novel, The Diary of a Madman, through a contemporary lens, while on the run's silent piece, So It Goes, tells a story of depression born out of grief. The same is true of Bryony Kimming's piece, Fake It Till You Make It, in which she and her non-performer partner, Tim Greyburn, reveal their experiences around his chronic depression. I'll always keep you, never mystery, your destiny, your destiny is me. <laughs> Duncan Macmillan's play, Every Brilliant Thing, starts with a young boy's list of all the best things in the world, written to help his mother through her depression. In the piece, performer Johnny Donahue asks the audience to help him read it out aloud. Number one. Ice cream. Number two. Water fights. Number three. Staying up past your bedtime and being allowed to watch TV. Number four. The colour yellow. What can theatre do for the subject of mental health that no other art form can do? The immediacy is the thing that theatre has over everything else. What you can do in a theatre that you can't do, um, you know, when you're reading a novel or when you're watching a movie or when you're going to an installation, um, is you can share something as a group that exists in and of itself only for that moment. And that's the thing that's sort of wonderful is that you have a shared but also entirely personal experience. And I, I think that's unique to theatre. In this country, we are crap at talking about mental health. Because, by and large, we're not very good at talking anyway. I mean, we're very chatty, wonderful, warm people, but we don't like to talk about serious issues too much. So in the, the way in which um, the form of the play is, is hopefully valuable in some way uh, when discussing mental health is it is about sharing. You know, discussion, chat, and hopefully you come away from it feeling uplifted and able to feel like you can share things. And that's all we're trying to do. Put it back onto the other forefront of conversation. When comedy gets serious, it can be quite a strong political force. Caroline Horton's Islands uses the grotesque clowning style of Buffon to lampoon the issue of tax avoidance. But one show this year suggests that finances may be a bit more complex than they seem. In the money, you can be a benefactor or a silent witness. If you're a benefactor, you pay a minimum of £10, or as much as you like. And if you're a silent witness, you buy a ticket and you watch. And the benefactors have one and a half hours to come to a unanimous decision about how to spend the money. If they agree unanimously in the time that they have, they get to take the money away and spend it. If they don't, it rolls over to the next show. The silent witnesses can ring a bell, pay their £10 and buy their way in. And uh, it tends to stay with people for a very, very long time. People come up to me. I mean, 
You've seen the show a long time ago. I have. Is that is that show still with you? Very much so. It's yeah. um, it's a fascinating thing. It's uh, it's the way that kind of rivalries bubble up without realising, um, but also the fact that no one can actually get anything done. Yeah. The sort of by committee mode that comes through. How important is it for you that there's uh, an element of activism behind the work? I'm not on any kind of campaign. For me, it's about art is about holding something up for other people to make a judgment about. I mean, obviously, I'm making some sort of comment about how ridiculous money is, but it's for other people to kind of take that on, absorb it and process it. The money is a game. It's about who gets a say and how. So's O, oh, a dance piece by Alexandrina Hemsley and Jamila Johnson-Small, who work together as Project O. Oh. Begging questions about gender and race, it's a multidisciplinary performance that critiques the way black women are presented, and often overtly sexualised, in mainstream contemporary culture. We have brought O to the showcase, and this is our first work. I think we always put the politics of identity on stage, whether or not we're acknowledging that we're doing that. Particularly with dance that's such a physical medium, there's always going to be an effect of some kind. As soon as there's movement, there'll be something that happens and that will have political consequences. And we always read bodies with this kind of filter whether or not we're thinking about it. That's always happening and I think to be able to make work that is kind of untangling that can give us some agency and a place within that conversation that's not just allowing ourselves to be passively read by others. In any festival, particularly one on this sort of scale, it's inevitable to get some overlap that shows start talking to one another. In many ways, the Edinburgh Fringe exists in the gaps between shows, the ideas that swim between different productions and even different art forms. That's particularly true of the British Council's Edinburgh Showcase, which provides a unique snapshot of the state of performing arts in Britain today, and who's making it, and how, and why.